Right over to you, Warwick. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this late November edition of ASSA Queensland. It's uh, lovely to see you all here. We've got uh, good numbers again. Um, this year, it's 50 years since ASSA started having meetings in Brisbane. And uh, if you see ASSA Queensland newsletter, it should be out tomorrow for local people and a few days later for the interstaters, I think. Uh, there'll be an article about that. This month's newsletter will be the last one edited by Peter Dunn, uh, starting with the January edition. Um, the new editor will be Jeff Nielsen. Now, Jeff's here. Would you like to give him a wave, Jeff? There we are. Thank you very much. Jeff's from Townsville and has known Peter Dunn since they were both young fellows up there. Uh, Peter Dunn's relinquishing the editorship because he's got so much else on his plate, and particularly with AHSA. He uh, runs the website um, of his own, of course, a big job there. But he's the uh, coordinator for Zoom and our secretary, and quite a lot of other things that he has to do. So that'll give him a bit of a reduction in his workload. There won't be any AHSA Queensland meeting in December. But in the new year, we hope to returning to live meetings at Archerfield Terminal. Uh, this is not a done thing for sure yet. If it's not feasible, then we'll continue with Zoom meetings uh, when we can have them. And they're good for out of towners especially. And uh, make it easy to record the presentations as well. It will be good when we can meet to share the camaraderie of a normal meeting. Uh, for future guest speakers, Don Furlonger, our Vice President, has got a good list. Uh, for January, we're saying with the last navigator, presented by Paul Goodwin, about Gordon Goodwin, a navigator in Bomber Command and later at Qantas. Uh, other other uh, presentations lined up are The Korean Kid, The Life of Jim Kitchenside. Kitchenside, I should say, no tea by Rochelle Nichols and Noel Dennett, who has presented for us before. We're talking about a B747 flight from Bangkok to Heathrow. Mark Clayton, at the discovery of a missing USAA Liberator, the Lady Anne, on Hinchinbrook Island, North Queensland. And we have plans for an outing in May to the hangar of the fighter pilot adventure flights at Archerfield, where Brad Bishop will allow us to closely examine their Spitfire 16, a Mustang, an L39 Albatross, and other aircraft they have there. Uh, that's the brief rundown from me, and I'll hand back to Peter to continue. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Warwick. Um, ladies and gentlemen, our guest speaker tonight is Michael Malkinton. Hope I pronounce something, pronouncing it right. Can't pronounce pronouncing. Michael uh, researches the history of armed conflict, especially where it concerns Australia and the other British settler societies. He is particularly interested in aviation and air power. Michael has a PhD in history from the University of New South Wales. Michael is an experienced secondary school history teacher and an adjunct lecturer at the University of New, S New South Wales, Canberra. Besides a number of articles that he's written, Michael is also the author of three books. Michael's first book, Fire in the Sky, the Australian Flying Corps in the First World War, was published in 2010 and is currently in its second edition. His second book, Flying the Southern Cross, Aviators Charles Ulm and Charles Kingsford Smith, was published in 2012 and also has been reprinted. Michael's latest book is Anzac and Aviator, a, bi a biography of the notable Australian aviator, Sir Ross Smith, who led the first crew to fly from England to Australia. The book features a foreword by retired NASA astronaut, Dr. Andy Thomas, and has been critically acclaimed in many reviews. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest speaker tonight is Michael Malkinton, and his subject is Anzac and Aviator. Over to you, Michael. All right, thank you, Peter. And um, I'd like to thank, um, thank AHA for having me uh, along tonight. Um, it's a real honor to speak uh, to you. Um, I've, uh, I'm just gonna share my PowerPoint 
presentation. Peter, is that showing up? Is that okay? Yes. Yep, that's okay. All right, we can get started. Um, on the 19th of, of uh, sorry, on the 10th of December, 1919, um, a truly extraordinary moment was captured uh, on camera by um, a uh, amateur photographer on a barren uh, field above Fanny Bay in Darwin. And it's the moment that the Vickers Vimy, G-E-A-O-U, um, piloted by uh, Ross Smith, um, navigated by his brother Keith, um, and crewed by uh, two mechanics of the Australian Flying Corps, uh, Wally Shires and Jim Bennett, touched down uh, on Australian soil 28 days after leave, leaving um, London, uh, the first ever flight from England to Australia. Uh, it was part of a competition that the Commonwealth Government had announced um, in 19, um, earlier in 1919. And um, uh, Ross Smith and his crew were the first, um, and as it would, would turn out, the only crew to, to make it during the, the competition's um, allowed time of 30 days. Uh, just two years later, Ross Smith would tragically be killed in an accident while pre preparing for his flight uh, around the world. Uh, I um, came across uh, Ross Smith while researching my PhD thesis. Um, I uh, first learned about him um, in my research and I, I actually discovered that um, there was an expansive collection of private papers in the State Library of South Australia. Um, and I didn't really end up using them all that much in my um, PhD thesis and, and my PhD work, but um, when I came across this set of papers, I I thought immediately this looks like it would be um, just the sort of collection that could support um, a biography of, of Ross Smith. Um, I was also surprised to discover that um, despite how rich the collection of papers were, literally, uh, including literally hundreds of letters written by Ross Smith to family and friends during the war and um, during the flight to Australia, um, that really there'd been um, very little uh, done in the way of biographical work on him. Um, in the early 60s, there was a book written by a family friend of the Smiths, um, uh, Archibald Grenfell Price, and um, it's a double biography of Ross and his brother Keith. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a good read, um, but it, it, it really relies mostly on the letters, and in fact, large sections of it are just um, edited extracts from Ross's letters. So, um, after doing my PhD, I was looking for another book project and I thought this one would be a really suitable one because uh, Ross uh, hadn't, hadn't had a full length biography and um, although there'd been a couple of other books on the flight, I thought it would be interesting to explore it you know, exclusively from his uh, experiences. Um, Ross uh, and his brothers uh, were South Australians and um, I would say that you know, they're still really well, quite well known in South Australia, much more so, I think, than other parts of the country. Um, when I launched the book there in Adelaide last year, um, you know, the book launch was really well attended um, and, yeah, pe people really re were really quite excited about the project and more broadly, the centenary of the flight as well. Um, Ross was, uh, Ross and his brothers, uh, Keith, and who I've already mentioned, and the younger brother, uh, the youngest of the three brothers, Colin, um, they, were, they were raised on a remote, um, sheep grazing station in rural South Australia. Their father was actually the manager of one of the largest um, sheep stations in the state. Um, and they spent, uh, Ross spent his first 10 years out there and had, had really, I think, what was probably quite a typical bush upbringing. And you can see on this slide, um, the family homestead um, at the time that Ross was a, a young boy. Uh, from that experience, I think um, he began to develop uh, quite a, a sense of independence and initiative that that kind of upbringing, you know, we might expect would would um, would would give to a child. Uh, he also um, discovered a love for horses, which he carried throughout his life, and and indeed he was a he was a very skilled and very keen horseman. Um, when he was ten years old, however, Ross's parents sent him and Keith uh, to live in Adelaide, and they were they were boarders at a, a school called the Queen's School. Um, it was a small school; there were only about fifty uh, boys there, um, but it was modelled very much on the, um, the the English public school system. Um, and in fact, that the headmaster had come from that system, so it was very very much in that sort of style of education and him going there is also a mark of the, the financial success the family was having as a result of, um, of uh, Andrew Smith, the father's um, success out on the, on the sheep grazing station. 
Um, at the school, Ross, um, although not academically brilliant, uh, he excelled on the sporting field and I would argue really came into his own um, through that experience of, of being at that school. Um, as a, as a teenager, uh, Ross joined the um, Adelaide Mounted Cadets. Um, so it was a, a mounted branch of the, um, of the Australian Military Cadet Service. And he had quite an extraordinary um, experience in that he was part of a, a round the world tour um, that, uh, that took place in 1910. And it was a, a group of uh, mounted cadets from all over Australia. I think there were about two dozen of them from memory. And they went on a tour quite literally around the world. They, from Australia, they went across the Middle East and, uh, and Europe and then across the Atlantic um, to tour North America before returning home across the Pacific. Quite, quite an extraordinary thing to do uh, for Ross, who at the time was, was only age 17. Um, the, 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 that, that trip really inspired him, I think, in a, in a few ways. Uh, one particular way was um, certainly that it gave him a desire to have a military career, which, which of course was to come into play a little bit later. But he also had some notable experiences on it. Um, when I was researching this part of his life, um, I came across, uh, unfortunately, he wrote very little about, um, about this. And, and, and I should point out, we don't have any words on the historical record by Ross um, until uh, 1914, until he's 21 years of age and until, um, and, and, and until we, we can actually, um, until, until he was actually enlisted and he was heading off to war. Um, so really for his whole childhood, his, his voice is lost to the past. And, and I had to use some other methods, which I'll talk about in a moment to try and reconstruct that. But when he went overseas with the cadets, um, one of his friends, a, a guy named Clifford Brown, um, who he in fact um, ended up sharing a, a room with during the tour, he kept quite a detailed diary that's now held at the State Library of Victoria. And I was thrilled when I came across that because it gives not only an account of the trip, but it gives some of really the earliest contemporary sources we have describing Ross as a as a as a boy, as a as a as an adolescent. Uh, one of the one of the really extraordinary things about that diary, as well as it describes um, a day in August 1910, it was a bank holiday Monday, where the boys were in London and Ross and Clifford Brown and a couple of their other friends actually went out to Brooklyn's um, aerodrome, which. Um, as, as you may well know, was, was the epicentre of um, the early aviation experimentation that occurred in Britain. It had a racing track around the outside, but there were a number of hangars built on the, um, on the interior of the track, and it was the site of an, a number of, of fairly famous early flights in British aviation history. And Ross and his friends spent a day out there in this August uh, 1910 Bank Holiday Monday um, watching aeroplanes fly. And it was the first time that Ross had ever seen uh, an airplane flight. Um, interestingly as well, um, which worked beautifully for my book and, and kind of provides some of the structure of it, um, while he was there that day, really I think marks the beginning of his um, journey in aviation. Uh, it's where it's where the, where the preparation happened for the England to Australia air race in 1919. And it's exactly where in 1922, he was tragically killed in an air accident. Um, putting together Ross's childhood was was quite a challenge because, as I've already mentioned, he didn't write or nothing that he wrote survives uh, from the time before he was 21 years of age. So I really had to improvise and, and work hard with the sources to try and piece together as best as I could um, an account of his of his early years. And I thought that was quite important because from a biographical perspective, I wanted to be able to explain why he became the man that he grew up to be, why he became such an extraordinary aviator, why he became such a courageous and extraordinary adventurer. Um, in doing that, I used a number of sources. Um, there were some letters written by friends of his, although they were written many, many years later. Indeed, some of them were written after his, his death uh, and they were reflecting back on his childhood. Um, after he became famous in the race, there were, of course, a number of newspaper interviews with his parents, which provided some key details for his childhood. Um, genealogical records provided some help, um, though, as I often, and this was a problem I, I came across many times in my research, with the surname Smith, um, it's often very difficult to use those records to try and pinpoint um, individuals. Um, another record that I found that was really helpful when trying to, to kind of piece together Ross's um, social life was actually the, 
social columns in Adelaide's newspapers. Um, the social columns were, I think, to, to what young people probably today use as um, Instagram or Facebook. Um, so whenever there was a ball or a dance or a fundraising event that Ross would attend, and he certainly was very keen on attending those, he'd be mentioned in the social columns. And not only would he be mentioned, but um, who he attended with would be mentioned. So I was able to use that to kind of reconstruct the social world of Ross Smith and to kind of, to kind of develop a bit of a picture of what he was like um, as a young man before the war. Um, three things I think really, um, I, I sort of describe in the book that there were three pillars to Ross's childhood that help us to understand the man that he became. They were sport, empire, nationalism and militarism. Um, sport, the first one, um, as I've already mentioned, he was a very keen and talented sportsman. And from that, I think he gets some early leadership experience, um, which of course is also developed through the Mounted Cadets um, as well. But it's that leadership experience, that initiative, that physical prowess that we see really um, come to the fore later on and, and, and I think contributes to his success as not only a pilot, but as a, as a leader um, in his squadron. The second one is empire nationalism. Ross Smith grows up with a sense that he is not only Australian, but that he's British as well. And he has this sense, I think, of, uh, of, a, of a British empire and a sense of responsibility that he feels to it. He's raised um, both by his parents, but also at the school that he attends to see himself as a citizen of, and indeed a servant of the British empire. And the third pillar, militarism, um, we need to remember that Ross Smith grew up in a society that venerated military service and it didn't so much see it as a career. I mean, Australia's army was tiny at the time. I think the Australian army, the, the professional Australian army before the First World War, numbered only a couple of thousand um, personnel. So rather that society saw military as a civic, a military service as a civic duty. And therefore it's, it's unsurprising that at the beginning of the First World War, Ross is one of the very first uh, people to enlist. He's in that sort of first cohort. Um, all right, so the letters that he wrote to his mother, they begin at the start of the First World War. Literally, he's uh, on, the, on the ship going overseas on, with the first contingent of the AIF in November 1914 when he begins writing these letters to his mother, um, Jessie Smith. And these letters continue throughout the war and indeed extend into the post-war years as well. They're supplemented by letters also to his brother Keith um, to some other friends uh, and family members as well, but the vast majority are to his mother. And these are an extraordinary historical source. Um, I've looked at a lot in my work. I've looked at many dozens and dozens, possibly hundreds of collections of private correspondence from this period. And I've got to say the Ross Smith letters um, are probably the most detailed and comprehensive personal account, or, or one of the most detailed and, and comprehensive accounts of the First World War from an individual's perspective that I've come across. Um, not only are they detailed, but they're quite candid and frank as well. Um, Ross seems to have had a really, um, a really close relationship with, with his mother and a very open relationship with his mother. And by and large, with a couple of exceptions, um, he, he is, is quite upfront and honest with her about how he's thinking and feeling as the war goes on. And I think it, it allowed me to get a bit of an insight into how, um, how he experienced the war, how it changed him, um, and, and yeah, how, how he saw the things, things as they were happening. Um, he joined the Australian Light Horse and was um, deployed to Gallipoli in 1915. Um, as, as infantry, of course, the, the light horse leaving their horses in Egypt. Um, Ross served at, um, he spent five months at Anzac Cove and he spent most of his time on these two positions here. Um, uh, a little bit of time at Quinns and, and the majority of his time at Pope's, uh, at Pope's Hill. Both of these positions more or less at the apex of the triangular um, Anzac position. Um, Gallipoli did present me with a bit of a challenge um, because it's one of the few occasions during the war when Ross's letters um, aren't as forthcoming as I would have liked them to be. Um, I speculate in the book that this could be a testament to the difficult conditions at Gallipoli, um, where many soldiers would have had difficulty um, getting, the, getting even the materials to write with. On the other hand, I think it also reflects um, in, in some ways, him trying to spare his mother 
some of the shock and trauma that he's experiences experiencing in his very first um, exposure to combat. Um, and in the few letters we have, he generally downplays the conditions, and he, you know, he tells his mother that they're safe and that, um, that the, you know, that they're comfortable and that there's plenty to eat and things like that. So actually, um, using uh, a number of collections of letters and diaries at the Australian War Memorial by other men in his unit, the um, Third Light Horse Regiment, I was able to, I think, construct a more accurate and and, and much more candid picture of what um, life was like at Gallipoli. And uh, as we know, it was it was deplorable. Um, and indeed, the thing that um, finally has Ross evacuated from Gallipoli in September 1915 is, as happened to, to many thousands of the, um, of the soldiers who were serving there, is um, enteric fever. Um, the following year, in November 1916, Ross, uh, Ross Smith transferred to the Australian Flying Corps. Now, to some extent, he was um, simply in the right place at the right time. His light horse unit was patrolling the Sinai Desert at this time, and um, uh, the first squadron of the Australian Flying Corps, number one squadron, uh, around that time um, arrived in the Middle East and began flying operations in the same area over the Sinai, in fact, cooperating with, uh, with the light horse, of which Ross was a part. Um, uh, on the other hand, though, um, besides being in the right place at the right time, uh, Ross was also just the sort of man that um, Number One Squadron was looking for um, because they were cooperating uh, with the light horse. They wanted light horsemen as observers because they would know the countryside and the tactics of the light horse. Also, Ross fit the bill in terms of physical fitness. Um, he was an officer already. He'd been commissioned um, towards the end of his time on Gallipoli as a lieutenant. Um, he'd gone to a private school um, and he was, he was quite sporty and athletically fit. So he really ticked all the boxes, so to speak, um, and was accepted into the, um, into the AFC as an observer in November 1916. Um, for Ross's part as well, he had great ambitions and he was very, very um, keen to be part of the AFC. Um, and I don't think this quite dates back to his um, experiences as a 17-year-old with Brooklands. We've got no evidence that flying captured his imagination at that point or anything. In fact, um, before attempting to go to the AFC, he actually was looking for, um, earlier in 1916, he was contemplating a uh, a transfer to the artillery because he wanted to go to the Western Front where he believed his prospects of getting promoted to a captain would be better. Um, however, when aeroplanes come along, he quickly, um, he quickly falls in love with aviation. He also writes to his mother that he sees aviation as having great potential for the future. And he begins thinking out loud in his letters, and it's quite fascinating to see this, but he begins thinking out loud about what his life might look like after the war. And he begins to see that flying might become part of that. Uh, one of my favourite moments in the letters, in fact, is... Um, uh, a brief note from the end of 1916, and he's writing it in the cockpit of the aircraft, actually, um, somewhere over the Sinai Desert. And he's writing to his mother that um, he imagines sometimes flying an aeroplane all the way home to Australia, which, of course, is what he will do three years um, later. Uh, Ross flew with the squadron throughout 1917 and 18, as I've mentioned initially as an observer, but um, in the middle of 1917, he trains as a pilot, uh, much to his delight, and he's posted back to the squadron. Um, most, of, most of the work the squadron is doing, number one squadron is doing over uh, Palestine by this stage is photo photography and reconnaissance. Um, the survey, the pre-war survey maps of Palestine were were pretty mediocre. They'd been done in the 19th century and they lacked a lot of detail. So um, the Royal Flying Corps in, uh, in Palestine was using aerial photography as a way essentially of, of producing um, new maps for, for the army to use in its, in its operations against the Turks there. So, so Ross's base work really in the squadron is, is aerial photography, which isn't hugely exciting stuff. It's not the stuff that, that really stirs the imagination when we're thinking of, of, of First World War aerial combat. Um, he's usually flying three to four times a week, um, and they're flying in formations of maybe four or five or even six aircraft, and they're essentially flying in formation and flying straight and level and photographing large um, 
sequential strips of land that can then be printed up into photographs and overlaid into collages and turned into maps. And that's essentially what he spends quite a bit of his time in 1917 and early 1918 doing. And it's, 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 it's not terribly exciting flying, but it's, it's absolutely crucial for um, General Allenby's um, operations against the Turks um, in Palestine. Um, there is aerial combat as well, of course, um, and in one of Ross Smith's first dogfights in September 1917, he took on a, a German albatross uh, biplane fighter um, head on and um, both pilots fired their machine guns and both pilots hit each other. Ross's bullets found their mark and, and, and shot the German aircraft down uh, and the German pilot's bullets um, ricocheted off um, Ross's machine gun actually and uh, forward firing machine gun and hit him in the face. One of the one of the bullet fragments actually passed uh, right through his cheek, wounding him on both sides of the face and breaking some of his teeth. And you can see him here in this photo, um, which he sent to his mother along with his bloodstained um, flying helmet and, and, and smashed goggles, which um, we can only imagine what she, uh, she would have thought of that. Um, he did he did emerge as one of the uh, number one squadron and indeed the Australian Flying Corps' outstanding pilots, uh, predominantly in the summer of 1918 when the German Air Service was attempting to contest the skies over Palestine and when number one squadron was uh, re-equipped with the um, superb uh, Bristol fighter, which we can see Ross um, in the cockpit of here with one of his regular observers, uh, Ernest Mustard, who of course also went on to have a, a notable career um, in aviation afterwards. <clears throat> Um, and yeah, Ross, Ross emerged as he was promoted to, to, to uh, flight commander um, and, and he emerged as one of the, of the, the really, really outstanding um, fighter pilots uh, in the Middle East. Um, eventually, he would be credited with 12 um, aerial victories and I, I, I report through most of those dogfights in the book. Um, and, he, and he was awarded uh, the Military cro Cross twice, oh, sorry, the, yeah, the Military Cross twice and the, uh, the Distinguished Flying Cross um, three times. And he's one of only, uh, I think, three or four British Empire airmen to get the DFC three times um, during the First World War. Probably, though, one of the outstanding features of um, Ross's wartime uh, flying career was that uh, towards the end of the war, he was given command of um, the RAF's only um, twin-engine bomber in the Middle East, and it was a twin-engine Hanley Page uh, 0400, um, which the RAF had brought out to Palestine, uh, brought out to Egypt shortly before the um, shortly before the uh, Allenby's final offensive um, to support that. Um, and Ross got experience flying this against the Turks in the final campaign of the, of, of the war. And then immediately after the war, he was invited um, by two of the senior ranking um, RAF generals in the Middle East to actually join them on a survey mission from Cairo to Calcutta, um, surveying an aerial route um, across the Middle East for the RAF, essentially to build a chain of, uh, of airfields um, across that region to aid in the British um, Empire's control of the area and also to eventually link up the far flung parts of the empire together. And so in December 1918, Ross set the controls of the Hanley Page flew uh, across the Middle East and uh, they arrived at Calcutta on the 18th of December. From here, Ross and one of the generals who he was particularly good friends with, uh, Gen uh, Major General Amius Borton, um, uh, known as Biffy, Biffy Borton, uh, to his friends, um, they decided uh, to essentially continue the flight all the way to Australia. Now, this was not part of the uh, later Australian government-sponsored competition that Ross would win. This was something altogether different and something that I think most people, including myself, when I came to this, weren't really aware of. Uh, Ross and Borton decided they were going to fly this aircraft, the Handley Page, to Australia, but first needed to identify um, places where they could land on the way between India and Australia. And so in um, the early months of 1919, uh, with the help of the uh, Indian uh, Navy, they actually did a survey by sea of uh, aerodromes uh, all the way from Calcutta down to East Timor. Um, and this was a mission that Ross and Borton undertook. And one of my favourite finds during my research was in the National Archives in London. And it was a 400 page um, Air Ministry file of reports basically documenting this um, survey journey, this little known survey journey that Ross Smith um, helped out on uh, during 
um, the early months of 1919, and it contains a number of reports um, that are in Ross's hand and are signed by him. Uh, and it's a wonderful account, really, I think, of the very foundations of air travel across Southeast Asia. Um, and it's also a really fascinating look into the social history of that area and the cultural history of that area as well, because Ross and Borton comment on many other things, both in these, uh, about those societies, both in these reports um, and in their private uh, diaries as well. Um, at the end of this survey journey, um, in about March 1919, um, Ross and Borton returned to India, ready to essentially fly to Australia. Now, their survey journey had been largely unsuccessful in the sense that they had they had realised that there was, besides being practically no airfields between um, Calcutta and Darwin, there was, or Calcutta and Sydney really at that point, there were a few places they could um, improvise. So, for example, there were race courses in, in many of these kind of um, imperial centres like Singapore um, and Rangoon that they might be able to land the Handley page on. But for future development, they realised that quite a lot of work would need to be done to establish um, permanent airfields uh, across the region. In any case, when they returned to India in, in March 1919, um, they found to their dismay that the Handley Page had been wrecked in a storm. Um, so they returned to Britain um, rather forlorn. Now, coincidentally, this was around the time that the government announced its um, £10,000 prize for the first Australian crew to fly from England to Australia. And it's at this point that Ross enters the race and with Borton's assistance, although Borton can't now be part of it because the, the competition was only open to Australians, with Vorton's assistance, um, Ross is um, able to secure the support of um, the Vickers Aeroplane Company. Um, so uh, Ross chooses Keith, his brother, to be the navigator, and you can see them here. Um, you've got Ross uh, standing here on the left and Keith beside him on the right, and uh, the mechanics, um, Jim Bennett and Wally Shires um, here as well. Uh, standing in front of the, the Vickers Vimy that, um, that Vickers supplied them with. So the aircraft that they were supplied with uh, was a Vickers Vimy, uh, a bomber that had been uh, designed for bombing Germany towards the end of the war as part of the RAF's um, independent air force. Um, it, however, came into service just a little bit late. And so Vickers was now turning its um, attention to civil aviation and hoping that the Vimy might um, might uh, be able to be of service there on some significant routes um, that were, were beginning to develop around the world. Uh, the Vimy that uh, Ross and Keith um, received was actually the backup machine for Alcock and Brown's transatlantic flight, which had happened uh, a little bit earlier in 1919. Um, it had two Rolls-Royce Eagle 8s, uh, both V12 engines of 360 horsepower. Um, it had a maximum speed of 100 miles per hour, uh, a cruising speed um, of about 90 miles per hour, a service ceiling of 7,000 feet. And it was designed to carry just over a tonne of bombs, um, which of course wouldn't be necessary on the trip to Australia. That weight instead was taken up by spare parts because large sections of the flight would be occurring in areas where there were no, um, no service, really serviceable aerodromes and no infrastructure to help them affect repairs and servicing. Um, the aircraft consisted of two cockpits, uh, the forward one which would be occupied by Ross and Keith sitting side by side and the rear one in which Shires and Bennett uh, would sit. And you can even see in this photo that there's um, some of the engine gauges are on the engines themselves and uh, one mechanic was allocated to be monitoring the gauges on each engine uh, during the flight. Uh, in the competition, there were going. Uh, by the time the competition began, there were five other Australian crews who had entered, plus one unofficial French crew, and that's a whole other story in itself that I think um, it'd be great for someone to write a book on because it's a really fascinating one. Um, but among all of the competitors, um, Ross Smith really was undoubtedly the favourite from from the very um, outset, and in fact, um, Richard Williams, who um, at the time was the um, the Staff Officer for Aviation at AIF Headquarters in, in uh, the United Kingdom. Um, he, he even thought at the time that, that yeah, Ross was really, um, the if anyone had a chance of doing it within 30 days, it was, it was Ross. And the main reason for that is because he was almost probably unique among Australian pilots during the First World War in having experience on flying 
twin engine aircraft over long distances. Um, he'd also had, he was also one of the only airmen in the world who'd seen the route firsthand and had indeed inspected the landing grounds that they would need to use uh, firsthand as well. Um, Ross planned the route um, essentially in three stages, uh, Europe, the first stage, the Middle East uh, and India, the second stage and the third stage across Southeast Asia and into Australia. There is a fourth stage, of course, which would involve a flight across um, Australia and um, ending, Ross hoped, at his father's sheep station in outback South Australia, although that was not quite meant to be. Um, the flight itself, um, Ross and Keith divided up the route into uh, distances of 15,000 kilometres, um, sorry, 1,500 kilometres, excuse me, um, of a maximum of 1,500 kilometres, which was about the, um, the endurance of, um, of the Vimy in, in reasonable winds. Um, some of, the, some of the, the sections of the journey were significantly shorter than that. Um, he planned initially to fly on 18 days, uh, and to rest on seven of them, which would give them a five-day buffer to arrive in Darwin um, to be eligible to claim um, the prize. Um, the journey happens, of course, in 28 days, so it doesn't quite go according to plan, and it's because a, a few things are working against them. On the first um, section of the route, um, they, they leave in, in November uh, 1919, and the first section of route across um, Europe um, that's very well serviced, of course, by um, airfields, either the RAF's airfields or, um, or Allied um, Air Forces airfields. But it is, of course, um, winter. Uh, it's the onset of winter. Um, and they're flying most of that time through, through snowstorms, quite literally, um, which, which causes some of the other crews to abandon their flight before even leaving Europe. Um, it causes the Vimy to be bogged um, on, uh, on, on one occasion in Pisa. Um, yeah, and it, it generally causes a number of issues for the crew. The middle section of the journey, the weather was almost perfect. So from Cairo to Calcutta, they had almost perfect weather. And this is the section that they made by far the, the best progress in terms of kilometres per day. The problem with this section of the journey, however, is that um, for much of this region, um, there are very limited um, in, in, they're, they're very limited uh, airfield uh, and, and aviation infrastructure. The RAF has a few very small airfields um, in the Middle East, um, in Mesopotamia. It has them in India, of course, but these are, these are very, very big distances um, with nothing in between. So any forced landing in between the few um, airfield locations probably would have ended the flight. The final section was recognised by both Ross Smith and many commentators at the time from uh, to be by far the most difficult. And this is the section from Calcutta across Southeast Asia down through the um, Dutch East Indies, or what we would now call Indonesia, uh, to Darwin. Uh, and in fact, one commentator at the time claimed that this, se this um, section would be far more difficult uh, a prospect than Alcock and Brown's um, transatlantic flight. Um, earlier in the year. And that's because not only would they be contending with um, wet tropical wet season weather, but by this stage, the Vimy would have traveled some nearly 10,000 miles and um, it would be, and, and have not had um, a proper overhaul in all that time. One of the things that really surprised me during my research was just how many remarkable narrow escapes um, they had. So many moments when um, the difference between um, the victory and the fame that eventuated could have very easily tipped the other way and ended the trip in disaster, either with the loss of the aircraft or perhaps the crew as well. Um, the crew suffered some really significant mechanical issues during the journey, which Ross played down in public because, of course, he wanted to protect the interests of his benefactors, um, Vickers and Rolls-Royce. But nonetheless, there were some significant mechanical failures. Um, they blew about half a dozen exhaust manifolds, um, and in fact, they ran out of spare ones. So the last stages of the flight were done on open exhaust. Um, they were bogged on three occasions, um, and the most significant and probably well-known time was in Surabaya in the Dutch East Indies, when to get out of it, they actually had the local administrators tear down the huts of um, perhaps hundreds of locals to create um, a 300 metre long stretch of bamboo matting runway for the Vimy to take off on, and remarkably it worked. 
uh, just after lifting off at Calcutta's polo uh, and racing course, they flew through a flock of birds. And um, so they got bird strikes on the aircraft, including on one of the propellers. Um, and Ross was amazed that that propeller didn't shatter um, because he'd seen propellers shatter um, with much less punishment than that. Incidentally, the propeller later did break um, over the middle of the Northern Territory and they had to have a forced landing. Um, probably though, the most, the, t the moment in the flight when I think they came closest to disaster was uh, in what was then known as Siam, but we of course would call, Singa uh, call Thailand. Um, and on this section of the journey, uh, Ross was starting from, uh, Ross and Keith and the mechanics were starting in Bangkok and they had originally planned to fly to Singapore in one jump, but that would have put the Vimy at its absolute maximum um, endurance. Um, and uh, while he was in Bangkok, the nascent um, uh, Siamese uh, Air Force told him that there was um, an airfield that had been established about halfway um, at a place called Singora. And um, they said that also not only had it been established, but there was fuel there. Um, and I might just read uh, a small extract from the book about what happened that day, because I think it emphasises the difficulties they faced in the flight in general, but also how close they came to um, really having to abandon it at this point. For three hours, Ross and Keith followed the Gulf coastline south through violent tropical thunderstorms. They searched for somewhere to land, but found the coastal flats covered in waterlogged rice paddies or thick jungle. When he finally spotted the aerodrome at Singora, six hours after leaving Bangkok, Ross was utterly dismayed. The ground was saturated. Large pools had collected on its surface and tree stumps remained scattered across the airfield. Unable to see any alternative and running low on fuel, Ross picked out a relatively dry strip running perpendicular to the wind. Easing the Vimy onto the sodden ground, he braced himself. Remarkably, GEAOU rolled to a stop with just one jolt as a stump tore off its tail skid. Walking back along the strip afterwards, Ross would discover that, discover that the tire tracks missed several obstacles by mere inches. Keith's disgust is palpable in that day's terse diary entry. Quote, Got down on so-called land and grout at Singora at 150. Very bad ground, tree stumps and holes everywhere. End quote. Ross's mood darkened further when he learned that the 500 gallons of aviation fuel said to be at Singora was in fact 500 litres. Nowhere near enough to sustain the Vimy's flight to Singapore or indeed return to Bangkok. If at any moment in the journey to Australia, Ross came close to despair, it must have been this one. Stranded on a remote, waterlogged and stump-strewn aerodrome with a damaged aeroplane and no fuel. It was also raining heavily. But they managed to get off. They used um, some uh, convict labourers from a nearby prison to clear some stumps and they had uh, repairs hastily made in a local factory and it's quite a story actually. Uh, them getting off. Um, I was aided in writing about the flight by several really quite fascinating sources. Um, firstly, in the State Library of New South Wales, there's Keith's um, maps, which are marked off both by the route they planned in 20 mile intervals, but also then in pencil uh, annotations that he made during the flight himself uh, by the route they actually ended up taking. And there were some variations um, during the journey. Then there's the, the, Vimy, uh, the Vimy's logbook itself. Unfortunately, um, Ross Smith's logbook has been lost. Um, it's, it's no longer available uh, to researchers, but the Vimy's logbook itself is still available and that gives some, some good outline details to the flight, um, including some of those mechanical issues I mentioned that Ross uh, otherwise obscured from public. Uh, knowledge at the time. Uh, Keith, as I just mentioned in that, um, in that extract I read, Keith did keep a diary, um, which we can see here, it's part of the Smith papers. And it's really a wonderful account of, um, of, of, of things each day from, from his perspective. Um, also, there's some extraordinary uh, photographs that were taken by all crew members. Um, this is probably my favourite one, um, taken of, this, of the French Alps um, on just the second day of the journey by Jim Bennett. Uh, Kodak had given each of the crews a camera and a supply of film and offered them a 500 pound prize for the best set of negatives. So they were a wonderful 
uh, addition to my to my understanding of the flight too, uh, and they're included. Uh, some of them are included in the book as well. Um, and of course, there is um, the aftermath of the flight as well, which is what the final section of the book deals with. And this is really the flight across Australia, which quite remarkably, um, after making the flight from England to, to Darwin in 28 days, it then takes them nearly three months to fly from Darwin to Adelaide. And that's uh, because of the significant mechanical issues they have with the Vimy um, along the way. And it's simply because the aircraft um, is worn out, both in terms of the airframe uh, as well as the engines. Um, I've already mentioned there's a propeller breakage in midair um, over the middle of the Northern Territory. Um, there's a catastrophic engine failure um, over central Queensland that detains them um, in Brisbane for, for several weeks. Um, there's another catastrophic engine failure uh, on the way to Melbourne. Uh, 60,000 people went to Flemington to greet the crew, um, only to be disappointed when Ross had to land uh, somewhere near, uh, near the border. And uh, there's another engine failure that, that, that was quite dangerous over Adelaide as well, um, where they nearly lost the whole propeller again. So the aircraft, by the time Ross um, takes the aircraft to Point Cook and, and leaves it there um, in about um, April 1920, um, the aircraft really is, um, is worn out and on its last legs, despite the fact that Ross is telling everyone that um, he could jump in it and fly it all the way back to England without too much trouble. Um, again, as an advertisement for Vickers. Um, one of the other really great um, resources that I was able to come across was um, a, a film that was made of the flight. Um, this was um, partly produced by the famous Australian photographer, Frank Hurley. Um, he wasn't on the flight from England to, to Australia, but he joined the crew in Queensland and so was part of the flight from um, through Queensland and, and, and down through New South Wales through Sydney and Melbourne and over to Adelaide. And um, this was made into a two hour feature film that Ross and Hurley and the rest of the crew took around the country during the, the, the remainder of 1920 after they um, handed the Vimy over to the government. Um, and they lectured to this film. It was a silent film, much as I suppose I'm doing now. They talked to the film, um, explained things that were happening um, and it was a real, it was a real hit. Um, I estimate probably around a quarter of a million Australians um, saw the film and went and saw um, Hurley and Ross Smith uh, in their lectures all around the country in concert halls and and, and cinemas and theatres. Um, yeah, really quite an extraordinary thing. Exhausting though for Ross. I counted up in the in the newspapers that in 96 days they did 140 showings of the film. And you know when you think that. They're two hour long sessions, a matinee and an evening show, and then narrating them. Um, you know, it's little wonder that by the end of um, 1920, Ross was was on the, the verge, I think, of, a, of a, some kind of nervous breakdown or exhaustion. And he actually leaves Australia, which I'll, I'll talk about again in a few moments. Um, so yeah, we've got shots here, obviously. You can see this is the perspective from the front uh, cockpit, Keith and, and Ross's perspective, looking back at the mechanics. Um, they communicated with each other via uh, notes, and some of those notes survive, and they're, they're quite quite interesting to read of the conversations that were had in the air. One of my favourites is a, a, a double page that says, any chance fire, with a big question mark. And I think that was um, when one of the exhaust manifolds blew and an and, and uncontained flame started licking out towards uh, a fuel strainer. Uh, this, this footage here we're seeing is from... Um, is from uh, Croydon on the day of the, the departure. Um, and so, yeah, Ross is there shaking hands with a few, um, a few either Vickers personnel or, or uh, RAF personnel or journalists that had come out. It was snowing, they, they left in the snow. Uh, and as I said earlier, the early stages of the flight across Europe were uh, significantly snowed in. You see in that photo as well just how close those enormous four-bladed uh, timber propellers pass via the pilot's head. There's actually a, um, a net guard, um, sort of a mesh guard on either side of the cockpit to, um, I think, remind the pilots not to wave as they take off or, or to reach out or, or anything like that. Could easily lose an arm. Unfortunately, um, what you're seeing here are some of the only sections of the film that survived. The original was, oh, that's that mesh screen I was just mentioning there to protect the pilot's uh, arms from the propeller. Um, 
Yeah, unfortunately, uh, very little of um, this film survives. Um, the National Film Sound Archive that has what I think is, is probably the only surviving um, extract of it. It goes for about 40 minutes um, uh, of the original that, that reviews in the newspapers report as being around two hours long. So, um, which I think is obviously a real shame. I think this is probably an edit that was created later on, possibly by Frank Hurley after Ross's death for um, release in the cinemas. Uh, of course, um, the crew wrote about, you know, flying at eight, 9,000 feet, um, the enormous, the immense cold. Uh, on the first day, um, they reported that their lunches froze, they were fro their sandwiches were frozen solid, um, um, the wings were developing ice. Um, this kind of thing, these animations, this was, this was a real modern spectacle. It was cutting edge at the time. And, um, yeah, people, people thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, all right, so the very final part of the book deals with another part of the story that I was not familiar with, but I found it quite fascinating. And that was really how Ross dealt with his fame and his, um, his uh, you know, overnight became world famous, the most famous Australian in the world for a period. Um, and it had an enormous, enormous strain on him, as I've alluded to earlier. And this painting was done of, um, of Ross in Sydney in late 1920. Um, and he's only 28 years old at this point. And I think when you look at this photo, he looks like a much, much older man. Um, and I think the strain is, is really quite evident on his face. Um, and indeed, he left, he left Australia very soon afterwards. Uh, he and Keith went to, the, uh, went to Britain uh, and they had um, initially planned to show the film um, in Europe and, and they did so for a limited run, although it didn't quite have the uh, level of interest in, in, in Europe that it did in Australia. And after that, Ross and Keith convinced Vickers to back another venture and it was around the world flight in a Vickers Viking amphibian aircraft. Um, and it was while preparing for that flight. In fact, on the very first time Ross took the controls of that aircraft at Brooklands in April 1922, that um, that he crashed um, the aircraft accidentally and killed both himself and um, Jim Bennett, who was to accompany them on that journey as well. Um, in the book, I go into a lot more detail about the causes of the accident and so on. But essentially, it came down to um, pilot error. Ross made a very sharp turn at low altitude. Um, the Viking, um, if you've seen a, a picture of it, I've got one in the book, sorry I, d I didn't put one on the slides, but it's a, quite an ungainly looking aircraft, literally looks like a, a boat attached to wings um, and it was, was renowned to be quite an in, I idiosyncratic um, machine to fly. In contrast, Ross uh, talked about the Vimy being quite a forgiving aeroplane to fly um, and it would always, in particular he mentioned, it would always give you plenty of warning before it stalled. Unfortunately, the biking uh, wasn't like that and he, he made a very sharp turn at 1,500 feet and got into a spin that he wasn't able to recover from. Um, and it was an enormous shock um, all around the world. People just couldn't believe that, um, that this, this, uh, this famous aviator had met his end in such a way. Um, Ross and Bennett, were their remains were repatriated to Australia. Um, I should mention as well that Keith, um, quite fortunately, wasn't on the aircraft. He was running late that morning and so... Um, quite tragically, was was there just in time to see the accident happen, and was obviously um, devastated by it. Uh, but as I said, their remains were repatriated to Australia, um, and there was a, a, a an enormous funeral in Adelaide on the fifteenth of June, uh, nineteen twenty two, um, and uh, Saint Peter's Cathedral, which we can see here in this photo, and then a funeral procession um, all the way up King William Road to. Uh, um, North Road Cemetery where Ross was buried um, and where much well, where later on Andrew and Jesse, his parents and Keith would be buried as well. There's a, there's a memorial plaque there as, uh, to commemorating Colin who was killed at Passchendaele in 1917 and who's buried at Lissenhoek in Belgium. Um, so, oh yes, and I, I, I should mention I, um, I stood on the spot where I think more or less this photo was taken when I was in Adelaide last year with my family for the book launch and uh, it was, yeah, it was quite, quite fascinating to stand there and just imagine how, how enormous that crowd was and the crowd continued all the way to North Road Cemetery which is several kilometres um, beyond where, where we're standing there. Um, yeah, so 
Look, I mean, in the end, I think um, Ross Smith is is an Australian, is an aviator that deserves to have um, much wider recognition in Australia. And I think that I think that during the events of the centenary last year, um, not just through my book, but through a, a wonderful documentary film that was produced uh, by Lainey Anderson with Andy Thomas. Um, uh, through a number of other initiatives, you know, too many to list here. I think Ross has in some ways become, been brought back into the public consciousness. Um, I describe him in the book as Australia's first great pioneer aviator. And I think beyond the obvious um, achievement of flying an aircraft from England to Australia in 1919 across large sections of the world, 20,000 kilometres of the world that didn't have airfields or aerodromes built, um, I think it's what happens immediately after the flight in some ways that's even more significant from the perspective of Australia's aviation history. I argue that he is one of the key people in bringing the air age to Australia. Um, tens of thousands of people came to see the Vimy when it arrived in Sydney and Melbourne and Adelaide and other places, Cootamundra um, around Australia, for example. Um, people came and saw the Vimy uh, people came, as I said, quarter of a million perhaps people came and saw the film. Um, in Adelaide alone, I think there were 14,000 school children who were taken to see the film during daytime matinee performances. And this is, I think this takes something that had been a fairly remote phenomenon during the First World War, and it actually makes it a reality for Australians. And while it's still going to be, um, while it still was to be many years before uh, flying from England to Australia became a viable commercial um, prospect, which of course was what the Australian government wanted to encourage through the competition. While that was still many years off, I think um, that the Ross Smith flight helps to really pave the way for that by preparing people's mindset, by inculcating a sense of air-mindedness among them. Uh, well, I think I might finish there. Anyway, um, Peter, I'll hand back over to you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks very much. Um, very interesting presentation. You um, certainly had a lot of great photos. I love photos and uh, there's a lot of photos there that I've never seen before. <coughs> um, one of the things I didn't know was that Ross Smith um, won the DFC three times. That's um, pretty interesting. My father-in-law won it once. <laughs> It's all he could afford. Um, yeah. the, interestingly, one of the other two, one of the other four who got it three times in the First World War was Harry Cobby, also an Australian okay. flying corps pilot. Yeah. It's two yeah. Australians out of the four of them. Well-known name. Mm. Um, also, um, those letters must be really fascinating to read. Um, some of the history in those. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Um, might throw the floor open for questions. For anyone got any questions for Michael? I second Peter's remarks. It's uh, very, very good to read. And of course, to know the basics, to really learn a lot of extra facts tonight. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, just a comment. I thought that Michael got the um, feeling of the age, the sort of uh, uh, imperialism, uh, the well, the class structure. You've got the uh, the Smiths and the uh, Shears and Le and Bennett of two different classes, and they are quite an amazing group of people. Those uh, um, upper class Australians of the early twentieth century. They were they were uh, really amazing. And, uh, and by the way, uh, Michael Smith um, uh, was, uh, I've been at him all the time to talk about the recreation of the flight across. And um, the problem is that he runs movie theatres. And when we landed in Adelaide on the 22nd, of course, COVID virus hit and he's been flat out trying to keep his movie theatres uh, afloat since then. But uh, in February or March, you will talk about the, re uh, the, the recreation flight in, uh, that he did. And uh, we're still up and flat out on the powerhouse and uh, we'll finish the record of the uh, Across Australia flight too and do that during next year. It hasn't been forgotten. Uh, 
Mm, I look forward to hearing. I must say that when the when the flight ended, I I, I was looking to to hear more about it, but it makes sense, of course, with COVID. So I look forward to that. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Um, Michael, when the engine failed badly over Queensland, what actually failed and who rebuilt it, and why did it take two weeks to rebuild it? And did they have to make special parts for it? <laughs> I think it was a, a big end bearing from, from memory, um, but um, they, so essentially they, they took the engine off the aircraft and, and remembering as well that the propeller had shattered uh, a few days earlier over the Northern Territory and Jim Bennett had actually um, rebound the propeller and, and essentially done a, a bit of a bush mechanics job on it. Um, so the propeller and the engine needed, I think it was the starboard engine from memory needed, um, needed repairing. They did it in the Ipswich rail, uh, railway uh, works. Um, and that I think was offered, uh, that was put at the Smith Brothers disposal by the, um, by the Queensland government. Um, and I think it took weeks, as you say, because they needed to, to make uh, from scratch parts of that, that otherwise worked available in Australia. From memory, a piston was, was thrown out and they never recovered it. So it's potentially laying out there in the bush somewhere. Um, <laughs> and so they had to make a new, like that, I'm assuming cast a new one of those. And um, it was, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it was weeks. I think it was about six or seven weeks that they were essentially, they, the Smith brothers themselves were in Brisbane, um, you know, enjoying and, and, and then being quite annoyed by all the attention, uh, initially enjoying, but then becoming quite annoyed with all the intention. But the mechanics were, uh, were involved in, um, in the repairs. During that time as well, the aircraft was, uh, was repainted um, at that time as well. And part of the reason was, is because um, during the way they, the, the, the fuselage of the aircraft had been covered in signatures. Um, of people going up and you know getting through police cordons and, and guards and things and and Ross Smith absolutely deplored that he, he just thought it was so disrespectful and was really quite annoyed by it so he had the aircraft repainted partway through the, the Australian flight. Thanks. I think at that stage um, the aircraft was out of Charleville wasn't it? Yes that's right yeah the aircraft was at Charleville and they took the engine into to Ipswich. There, there is a memorial out from Charleville, marking the spot where they actually came down. Right. Not a very significant one, but there's one there, yes. Right. I haven't been there. And as I say, though, there's a, I think there's a broken piston somewhere lying around out there. <laughs> <laughs> Once they got the engine to the railway workshops at Ipswich, they then had to reverse engineer it using a bus to make up a new piston and new crankshaft for it. I, okay. I assume so, yeah, yeah. Phil Weber has a question for you, Michael. Um, fantastic story, Michael. Great presentation. And I'm really loving reading the book as well. There's so much in it that I had no idea about. Um, as a historian of sorts, um, I'm really fascinated by your sources for this. And I'm just wondering if you can talk maybe about how you track down some of the amazing things that you found. And for example, the diary of the um chap who was with him in the UK in 1910. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I was spoiled by the richness of the Smith papers. So a lot of, I probably did the bulk of my research um, in, in, in the State Library of, uh, of, of South Australia. Um, so that made things a little bit easier and there's a great finding aid, you know, that sort of catalogues quite, quite um, comprehensively what's in those papers. Um, I suppose my previous work on the Australian Flying Corps made using the records at the Australian War Memorial and in the UK at the National Archives, where a lot of the AFC's records are still held, that probably made that a bit easier. Um, beyond that, I must admit, um, really Trove, I found to be incredibly helpful, um, which many of you are probably familiar with. So, for example, specifically with the, with the boy Clifford Brown's diary, um, I simply found, well, not simply, it was, a, it was a real pain in the neck, but it, was, it turned out to be worth it. And sometimes it doesn't turn out to be worth it. I mean, that's, that's the thing. There's, there's obviously a lot of dead ends. But um, with his diary, I found in the newspaper reports of the um, Round the World Tour, I found a list of names of the cadets. 
and I essentially spent time running their names through Trove um, to search if anything was in any of the state libraries. And to be honest, I was I was totally surprised when I got a return on Clifford Brown uh, and his diary. And I was fully expecting that it might be this brief, you know, kind of almost itinerary. I certainly didn't in my wildest dreams think that it would mention Ross Smith, let alone, you know, talk about him in detail and describe his first encounter with an aeroplane. So I think I just got really, really lucky there, um, Phil. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Any other questions? Um, can I just make a, a uh, comment? Um, I used to live in Ivanhoe in Melbourne, and in semi-retirement, I um, I had to travel across west across Melbourne and uh, walk across a creek there, catch a bus. This is back in the early two thousands. Catch a bus across to my work. And it took me a while until I twigged that, um, I'll just hold up, you won't be able to read this, but this is a Melway Street directory. And um, I was standing at the bus stop one day and it started to look at the street names. And just in this little area of suburb of Elfington, there is the Bennett Street, Shield Street, Keith Street, Smith Street. Um, all, and Ross Street, all adjoining each other. So obviously there was some um, feeling of passion uh, when the subdivision took place. So they decided to uh, remember the flight with by naming the streets after the, the aviators. Yeah, Lindsay, that's, that's a really good point. And that happened all around Australia. Mm. And um, I actually came across a newspaper article from later in the 20s because in the last chapter of the book, I, I wanted to kind of look at his legacy and how he'd been remembered. Um, I think a lot of people assume that he was, and a lot of people were saying, I think in the lead up to the centenary, that he'd been quote unquote forgotten. And I think I argue at the end of the book that while he's not as well known today as he was in the 20s and 30s, I don't think he's been forgotten at all. Uh, and it's things like, you know, those street names. And I came across an article, um, I think it was from either the late 1920s or early 1930s, and it commented on the proliferation of school children who were named after Ross and Keith Smith in the early 1930s, you know, as they were sort of getting into school age. And not only were there many boys named Ross or Keith, but many were named Ross Keith such and such you know keith is a middle name some indeed were even named ross keith smith and then their surname <laughs> so you know i mean australia went, went absolutely mad over these guys i think it was um you know when i'm talking to 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 groups about this sometimes i use the analogy of beetle mania you know when the beatles visited um australian cities in the in the mid 60s um it was unbelievable and and um you know also the way that it was commercialized um, in the State Library of South Australia's collection, there is all manner of um, ephemera, um, you know, of merchandise, uh, you know, programs, souvenirs. Um, Frank Hurley took a series of um, aerial photographs of Australian towns and cities they passed over. That was published um, to great acclaim, of course, you know, because most people hadn't seen their city from the air. Uh, there was a board game produced for children you know, the England to Australia, the Sir Ross Smith England to Australia uh, board game. Um, and Ross was approached by this succession of companies that wanted to use his name. My favourite one was um, Gillette, uh, because everywhere he went, journalists would comment on how incredibly well groomed he looked, even after 10 or 12 hour flights, you know, peeling off his flying overalls underneath, he'd have a tie, and his dress, AIF dress uniform, and he'd be clean shaven. And Gillette picked up on this. And there's advertisements in newspapers at the time commenting on, on how their safety razors are so easy to use that you can even use them in the air. <laughs> you know, of course he wasn't shaving in the air, but you know, so you, the, the comment you make about the street signs, I think is, is a really good one because it's, a, it's, a, it's an enduring reminder of the, albeit brief, but, adulation you know intense adulation that australians had for these men thank you yeah 
Michael. just found in Grenfell Smith, when the port engine was taken to Ipswich, it needed one new cylinder, two pistons, all the big ends, two connecting rods, six new valves, a new manifold, and the sun patched. I think there's a technical term for that. I don't know if I, it'd be polite for me to say right here. <laughs> Michael, um, Roderick Smith has a question. How remote was the family sheep station? Yeah, so it was a station called Mutaroo. Um, and it was, I think it's about, a, I think it's a couple of hundred kilometres west of Broken Hill. So it's only just inside the uh, South Australia, New South Wales border. Very remote. <laughs> yeah, uh, from memory, um, from memory, I think the train journey was about, 40 hours, you know, including all the stops and changeovers and things. So the boys only went home in the holidays. It was, mm. um, you know, a two or three day, um, two or three day proposition. I think it was 40 kilometres from the homestead to Coburn, which was the nearest, nearest town, nearest train station. Yeah. Thank you. So pretty, pretty darn remote. Um, when I was trying to get a sense of, uh, of, of, of the sheep station, um, to give you a sense of the scale of the sheep station, at one point I found that Andrew Smith, uh, Ross's dad, found a, um, the, the body of a drifter who died while going across the sheep station, unbeknownst to him, of course, um, and they determined the body had probably been there for three months before he was found. And this is on, on, on their station, so. Yeah. Thank you. Very large property. Any other questions? 30 years ago, uh, I was working with uh, Queensland Rail um, Engineering. I, I read a quite a detailed report on the manufacture of the propeller at Ipswich. And that was quite an achievement at the time. The people who were, uh, who did that were actually um, uh, carriage builders. They were building rail, uh, wooden railway carriages in, in the Ipswich workshops and maintaining them and so on. And suddenly they had this job. They had to figure out how you built uh, a wooden propeller and quite a large one as well. And all they had left was the hub of the original propeller. Um, and uh, it, was, it was quite a technical achievement to, to create a propeller with, the, uh, with, with virtually no knowledge at all of how to do that. And, uh, Sorry? They would have had the other three blades, would they not? Uh, I don't know. I don't know how many no. of the blades survived. But they, they needed the hub so that they could fit it onto the... Oh, absolutely. The that system. was a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah th thank you. Um, the, yeah, that's a really good point, Jeff. So the, the propeller that they replaced, as far as I understand it, is intact. And it ended up in Point Cook. And I think it's in maybe the sergeant's mess at Point Cook. Someone, if, if someone knows otherwise, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've seen photos of it and you can still see the strips of um, metal binding that Jim Bennett put on it in the wilderness to, to, to keep it from, from, um, from shattering again, you know, on the flight um, into, into Queensland. Um, the, it, it was so bad that engine failure, I should mention, that Ross cabled Vickers representative in Sydney and said, essentially where we're catching the train, you know, send someone to collect the aircraft because they knew that getting the spares that they needed or a new engine from, from the UK was months away. And that's at that, it's at that point that the, the Queensland government stepped in. And, um, and I think of the mechanics as well, Jim Bennett really, again, played a, a lead role in essentially saying to Ross, look, if we can get the right equipment and I can get some help, I think we can... I think we can fix this. And it's, I think, Jeff, as you point out, it's an extraordinary feat that they, they were able to do that. Okay. One last question. Okay, well, we might um, call it quits. Th uh, thanks again, Michael, for a, a very uh, excellent presentation. If we could all show our appreciation. For, uh, for Michael's efforts tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Um, and if you if you get around to reading it, I, I hope you enjoy the book. Do send me an email. Um, if you Google my name, I've got a website with a with an email, and I'd love to love to hear from you. Thank you. My battery. It's running out.